Welcome back to another edition of Combat Corner. <clears throat> Powered by Come On Now, the podcast. I'm your host, Rudy Rodriguez Shomont. Let's talk UFC 306, Noche UFC, Riyadh season, whatever other thing they want to throw in there, for whatever other culture they want to add. I get it. I understand. <clears throat> it's Mexican Independence Day. Much respect to all the Mexicans out there. I said before this card, first of all, don't listen to my picks. <clears throat> I try on picks. I, I sometimes pick with my heart. At the same time, I picked Ortega. I picked Grasso. And I picked Marab. Obviously, I went one and two. Ortega did what I hoped he wouldn't. First off, Ortega should have been fighting Lopez in a five-round fight, not a three-round fight. <clears throat> but I don't think that would have mattered because I think Ortega would have gotten the tar beat out of him from what I saw. Dead ass. I, I think Ortega would have gotten this shit out of him worse. It wouldn't have got it would have gotten worse. His ankle was shot from all the kicks. Lopez. Throws with all his might. He drops Ortega early in the fight when Ortega's dry. Ortega's eye is moused up, bleeding everywhere. He's trying to get some mission attempts. He gets up. He lands some shots. You see Lopez might be getting a little tired. But that's why you need to fight Lopez in a five-round fight. Because your hope is that all that energy he's got – to be so aggressive because he really clinches up on every punch he throws. And they talked about it in the broadcast. <clears throat> and you saw it versus Dan Ige. Ige gave him some trouble. Um, You saw that. So it, it's one of those things where he just put so much torque into everything. And in the second round, you can see him slowing down a bit. I thought it take a one round too. But, oh, but he didn't look good. He didn't look good. I thought he arguably could have won round two. Round one, he got killed. Round three, he got killed. And Ortega is just, I don't know. He's he's He beats Yair Rodriguez, who's a, a stud. But he gets absolutely murked out there by Lopez. Lopez looked way bigger than him to me. Musk, like size-wise, just looked way bigger than him. Lopez cuts a lot more weight, you can tell. Lopez probably could fight at 55. That said, Lopez is now ranked in the top three. And he's up next. I mean, I thought that this wouldn't be a number one contender type of fight. But I have this I have this feeling, depending on how this fight goes between Toporia and Max in October, <clears throat> I have this feeling that if Max wins, he fights Lopez. For the belt. If Toporio wins, I think there's a rematch with Volkanovski. That's my belief. But we shall see what happens in October. I know this. Lopez will be ready for whoever. Lopez will be ready on a day's notice. To wait. Look, this guy is just he's tough as hell, man. Tough as hell. Now, the Valentina fight against Grasso. And you wake me when it ends. That was arguably one of the worst fights I've seen. It, it wasn't the worst. I've seen worse. <laughs> but to, to watch, to watch a kickboxing Muay Thai world champion in Valentina Shevchenko, so afraid to stand and box and kickbox with Alexa Grasso. Is painful. It's painful. I found the, the refereeing so interesting because, you know, you're watching the Marab fight with Sh Sean O'Malley and Herb Dean is telling these guys to be active. He should have refereed the, the Valentina fight with Alexa Grasso because Valentina basically laid on her for five rounds. She basically laid on her for five rounds. That's what happened. It was dreadfully boring. 
Shevchenko did nothing on the feet. She went for takedowns over and over. And, and you know what? More power to her. I can't criticize it because it's Alexa Grosso's job to not get taken down. And Alexa Grosso looked like she had not trained for takedown defense in years. Because she managed to stop some of these takedowns when they fought the first time and the second time. The night, well, the last night, she's being taken down at will with ease. It wasn't even hard. It was easy. And then she just lays there. She stays, she, she keeps Valentina in guard. Or is wrapping her in a, in, in a triangle from the bottom. Your first goal needs to be to scoot all the way back to the cage to get up, not to lay there for three minutes at a time. They were not standing that fight up. They let Valentina Shevchenko lay on her, and she did nothing to stop it. <clears throat> nothing to stop it. And they're saying this trilogy, this this trilogy is over. I, first off, okay, let's let's take a look back. Alexa won the first fight. I thought Alexa Grasso won the second fight. Some people thought the other way, but it was a it was a draw. Valentina won this fight. Why would there not be? Okay, let's go back. I don't think there's much interest in a fourth fight, but why would there not be a fourth fight? Who else is there to fight for the belt? Alexa Grasso won the belt, defended the belt, arguably won that again, and then had to give another rematch to, to Shevchenko, for which Shevchenko's win was very, very uninspired. Dominant, but uninspired and boring. Now, I guess the thought process is, you know what, she'll do that again to Grasso, but I don't know, because she didn't do it the first two times like that. Grasso looked like she just forgot how to fight. I mean, <clears throat> this is one of those things where you sit there and you're wondering, was something wrong with her? Was she sick? Something, I, what What was going on? Because she did not fucking compete. That was a non-competitive situation there. Non-competitive fight. At no point is she scooting towards the cage in five rounds. It was mind-blowing. You know, um, the fight with Marab Devashvili. He beats Sean O'Malley to win the belt. So you had the belt changed hands in both of the fights. Marab dominated Sean O'Malley, as I expected him to. Now, clearly I'm not very good at picking fights because I got the first two that I picked wrong. But I thought Marab was as close to a lock as there was. His wrestling is nonstop. He is relentless. He does not get tired. And yet somehow, in the midst of dominating for five rounds, two judges gave Sean O'Malley two rounds. I'm guessing they gave him round five, and I'm guessing they gave him round three. But what are you watching? What are you watching? Yes, that's correct. Two judges gave him round three and round five. One, all three judges gave round five to Sean O'Malley. How? Because he landed two kicks up the middle, the first that kicked Marab in the rib under his left side of his rib and clearly did something. I don't know what it did. Maybe it broke a rib. It's not as – the liver is on the other side, on this side. He kicked him here. So I don't know what happened on that kick. And it made Marab wince, but I'm sorry, you don't lose a round because you winced off of a kick. You don't lose a round because you winced off of a kick. What the fuck is going on? What is going on when 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 you lose a when you lose a round because of a kick? Sean did Sean O'Malley did nothing in that round outside of those two kicks. He landed it once and he landed it again and Marab successfully evaded. I, I, I mean, round three. Marab outlands him 25 of 46 to 11 of 21. 
and you give Sean O'Malley the round. Explain that one to me like I'm a five-year-old. Is it because round one was 20? I mean, round one, 25 to 14. Again, I don't use strikes as a barometer, but I watched the fight. It was nonstop control. He takes him down twice, has dominant position and takedown and, and, and taking him down, top position. Round two, 65 to six in strikes. 65 six. One of one in takedowns, dominating position. I mean, when you get out struck 65 6 in a round, you should not be in a 10 9 round. That's a 10 8 round. I'm not saying that was a 10 8 round because it wasn't. I watched the fight. But if you look at it on paper, you're like, how is that not a 10 8 round? Round three was better for Marab than round one. Round four, 74 to 7, one for one on takedowns. Like, this was a mauling. This wasn't a close fight. <clears throat> round five. Round five. Marab outlands him 25 to 11. Marab throws 42 strikes. O'Malley throws 21. Marab takes him down twice. Explain to me how he can lose that round. I, I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And anyone who thinks that O'Malley won a round should never judge fighting. Because that was as bad. They tried to give this fight to O'Malley. They tried so badly. This guy didn't land 50 strikes the whole god darn fight. He got out landed 214 to 49. He threw less strikes than Mar he threw 91 strikes. Marab landed 214 strikes. It's like, what are we talking about? How is this not a, a 50 45 across the board? If you go on MMA decisions, and even here, I'm shocked. You got people that gave O'Malley round five. Like, what the fuck are they watching? He landed 11 strikes the whole round and two kicks that made a guy wince, but otherwise got dominated in the entire round. Like, what the fuck? What, do, what, what is wrong with people? <clears throat> uh, Mind-blowing to me. Dominating performance by Marab Devalishvili, as expected. Boring fucking fight. Boring. O'Malley basically let Marab control him. He did not throw his hands. He was so worried about the takedown that he wouldn't even throw. I'm surprised we didn't see more uppercuts from O'Malley. I'm surprised we didn't fight, see him fighting at a lower, like a lower crouch stance to, you know, potentially fend off takedowns. O'Malley looked like shit. He looked like shit. He looked like what I thought Aljo would do to him, but it actually happened this time. It actually happened. Fight starts. Fight starts off weird with Marab yelling at the coach on the outside. As apparently uh, O'Malley's coach is trying to yell to Marab coaching. I, I I don't know what was going on. That that was weird. Then Marab kisses him on the back of his head and his back, and then you know he walks away. And then O'Malley tries to hit him in the back of the head. And then Herb Dean says, "Well, that's your fault. You did that. You told him to stop." So he got up. There was still time left. I I, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't. Well, let's talk about UFC 306 as a whole. The best fight of the night, the best fight of the night, without a doubt, Daniel Zellhuber versus Esteban Ribovitz. Actually, shit. Ronaldo Rodriguez and Odie Osborne was a pretty goddamn good fight, too, but Zellhuber and Ribovitz was incredible. That third round, I do not know what Zellhuber has in his brain, but it's a rock because Ribovic hit him with everything. He hit him with everything. And I thought Ribovich won the fight, and he did win the fight split decision. A uh, huge win for him. But that was un unbelievable. That third round was unbelievable. He was in nonstop attack. Round three, he out, I mean, 92 strikes in a round. This wasn't on the ground. This was stand-up. 92 strikes in stand-up. He threw 191 strikes in round three. Are you are you crazy? Zell Huber threw 116, landed 43 strikes. <clears throat> I, I, I mean, and hell, Zell Huber knocked him down early in that round. That was a fun fight to watch. Absolutely fun fight to watch. 
again, it was funny that the two fights with the lesser names that no one's really heard of. I've heard of Zell Huber and Rivovich, but like, and I've heard of Odie Osborne. I never heard of Ronaldo Rodriguez. He had one fight in the UFC. That fight, Osborne was going to was gonna finish that fight in the first round. Don't know what the hell happened there. That fight should be over within the first round. Um, turns it around around two. I thought Osborne still won. I thought he won. They gave the fight to to Ronaldo via unanimous decision. I was actually kind of surprised by that. But you know what? The Mexican crowd, whatever. Those two fights were the best two fights on the main card, even though they're the ones with the least names. Because the Ortega-Lopez fight was brutally bad. It was an ass-whooping. The Grasso-Shevchenko fight was a snoozer. And even the, even the Marab O'Malley fight was a snoozer. Dreadful. <clears throat> You had a really gross cut over Irena Aldana against Norma Dumont. Bro, Rosas Jr. wins. But let's talk about this. It was a spectacle. It was a spectacle. I will tell you this. I was not there. I'm not in the building. On TV, it looked incredible. There, it must have been otherworldly. However, I thought that they would use that entire wall and have that as one big-ass TV. I thought that entire wall would be a TV. Not having broken, like, little, you know, screens positioned. I thought that whole wall would be a TV. The graphics, the production, all of it top-notch. Top-notch. But do I ever want to see a fight there again? No. That fight card wasn't about the fights. That fight card was about the production. That fight card was about, let me see how much money I can spend to make this as crazy as and wow as possible so that you ignore the fact that there's only 10 fights in this card and that most of these people on this card you've never heard of. And that you had six decisions. <clears throat> six? Let me see. Three on the main card. Decision. 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 Yeah, you had six decisions. It, it's one of those things where you you want to be. I'm sorry, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. All the main card fights were a decision. There were eight decisions out of ten fights. Now, the Ribovich, Zellhubier, and Rodriguez Osborne fight were really good fights. But the other three were bad. And I, I mean, I'm being completely transparent. I didn't watch the undercard at all. <clears throat> I didn't watch it at all. And you have three more decisions. I'm never, I'm never one that's going to criticize decisions because I think you can have some great fights that go to decision. And I think Rodriguez and Osborne and Riverbridge Zell Huber were both great fights. I, I thought that at worst, I mean, Osborne gets a split decision win. I mean, he he got unanimous decision loss. They even gave it a 10-8 round, I guess round two, which I didn't think was a 10-8 round, but what do I know? And uh I think that's really at the end of the day what it was about. It was a spec. It was an it was, it was an extravaganza. It was a production, incredible production. The graphics were wild, off the chain. Um, it felt like some of the stuff was falling on top of you from the screen. It, it was real sharp. It was it was good. It, it, you can't you cannot the are the production incredible. Would I want to sit in the four hundred level to watch that? Not a chance in all fucking hell. $2,500 to sit up there <coughs> or more to sit in the roof? Bro, from the video I saw from that level, the, the, the cage looks like this. No, not interested. Not interested at all. It's too far away. It's too far away. You're watching the whole fight on the, on the TV screen because you can't see the, you can't see anything in there. Mind you. A lot of times, even in the arenas, you're watching a lot of the fights from the from the jumbotrons because it gives you a better angle, even from the lower level. But I do watch fights in the cage, and I do like watching them in the cage. 
overall, the card itself, I said that beforehand. The production, top notch. Top notch. But I don't want to, I don't want to have this, I don't want to sacrifice quality of the fighter, not the fight, because look, you can't control what you can't control. You can't control that Alexa Grosso is gonna land her back and not try to get up for five rounds. You can't control that Brian Ortega looks completely out of shape when he walked in the cage. You can't you can't control it. You can't control that Sean O'Malley's not gonna throw his hands because he's so afraid of being taken down. But what you can control is putting in fighters who are contenders with a chance to become number one contenders and create stars of those people. You control that. And I'm so tired of watching the UFC pass off guys and women and men, men and women who are not at that level yet, and you keep throwing them on pay-per-views. You have enough fight night cards throughout the year that you don't need to waste pay-per-view on up-and-coming fighters that no one's heard of. Build those fighters up on fight night. Do not build them up on a, on, on a pay-per-view because what you can do is you can actually put them on the, the fight card as an early prelim. No one's heard of them. No one really cares. But when you want to put a fighter on a paid, a paid programming, $85 to watch five fights, and most people haven't heard of the first four fighters on the card, Yes, they showed out and they did their job. Congratulations. I love what they did. They came to, they, they came to fight. But is Ronaldo Rodriguez a contender because he beat Odie Osborne? Fuck no. Fuck no. Is he in the top 15? No. Top 20? No. Top 25? No. Odie Osborne was 4-4, four 4-5 and four, four and five in the UFC. A better fighter would have finished him in round one. And that's my problem. Don't put that on a fucking fight card and, and, and of a pay-per-view. Put it on a fight night. I, I think at times the UFC has lost track of what it's supposed to be doing on these pay-per-views. Pay-per-views are supposed to be the biggest events you have each month. They're supposed to be the biggest events each month. <clears throat> I don't expect 11 barn burners or 12 barn burners but I expect my pay-per-view card, those first five, to be names of substance fighting for positioning in ranking to be ranked number one. I keep saying it. I'm going to say it again. Contenders, fights that have meaning for contendership. Now, the Lopez fight did have meaning at the end of the day because he beat the piss out of Ortega. Because I don't think I don't think Ortega was up for a title shot had he won. I think Lopez actually is now because he beat the shit out of Ortega. He beat his ass. But overall, the card itself was the production was amazing. The production was amazing. I'm sure being in that building must have been absolutely freaking crazy. But I don't want to see it in that building anymore. Let's get back to freaking T-Mobile. Let's get back to re regular arenas because it takes away too much from the actual card. I, I think it became so much. It was hyper focused on oh my god, look at that. Oh my god, look at that. Oh my god, look at that. But I'm not here to look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. I'm here to look at that. What's in the cage? That's what I watch for. I don't watch for the graphics. I don't watch for that. How the hell is Dan Ige not on this card? He saved your ass a couple months ago. Why is he not on this card? Don't know. I'm sure there's a reason, but nonetheless, what's next for the UFC? UFC 3 oh, I mean, up next is actually um, a fight night with Ronaldo Moicano against Benoit saint -Denis. That's going to be a nice fight. That's in two weeks in Paris, France. Then we go on October 5th, Alex Pereira versus Khalil Roundtree. And then later on in October, you have a UFC 308 with Topuria and Holloway. So a lot of fights coming up. Uh, keep watching. We'll be talking about them. And uh, we'll always give you our honest opinion, whether you agree with it or not. But thank you for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Ring that bell so you get all the up-to-the-minute updates. Come on now.